It's Lefty. This is the Lefty Show. Welcome, everybody, to the Lefty Show. Happy Friday to one and all. I love Fridays. It's a great, great place to be. You know the weekend's coming up. You got nothing to do. No responsibilities. Go and get drunk. It's like it's Christmas. It's Christmas. You got nothing to do. You're on holiday break, some kind of vacation. You got nothing to do but go out and get drunk. Anyway, welcome, everybody, to the Lefty Show. And I thank you, as always, for your continued support. Liking and favoriting on YouTube is always appreciated. It does help me out. And, uh, and again, I love, I love everybody supporting the show. It's been amazing. Thank you all very much. And <laughs> getting back to it, I love Fridays. And uh, we, we recorded PKA earlier today. <gasps> Confirmation. By the way, it is um, May the 2nd. As uh, May, May the second, twenty fourteen. I'm saying that just in case the show runs really long. Like, well, you say May the second, Lefty, but it's 2015 now. It's 2016. You're, you've been doing this show for years. What year is it? I don't even know. It's 2014. May the second, 2014. My uh, my tablet is actually supposed to be here today. I'm excited about that. I'm excited to have a tablet in my life, and I am excited to make awesomeness with the tablet specifically more specifically talking about clips and sound clips sound bites and uh and sound interludes being brought into the show really excited to do that really excited to add that dynamic but we recorded pka earlier today it was a it was a it was a great show i was uh, i was really happy with it you guys you guys will hopefully thoroughly enjoy it when you see it. I believe on Saturday tomorrow. I'm uh, we had a we had a good talk about a lot of things. There was actually PKA plays was hammered out. That's what you can look forward to in tomorrow's show. One of the many things you can look forward to in tomorrow's PKA is us hammering out details on PKA plays. It's gonna happen. It, it, it always was going to happen. It always was. You know, sometimes when you plan things and you get really excited about it when you first think about it. You get really excited. Whatever, whatever topic it is, whatever your plan is, you can, you can go, I want to I refinish this. I want to build this. I'm going to take a class on this. Or I'm going to start this, create this, do whatever. It's anything, right? I, I want to beat this video game. And you get really excited about it for a while, for an initial period, however long. You get really excited about it, and all you can do is think about it, talk about it, and ponder what it's going to be like for you to be able to do this, to do whatever it is that you have in your head. And you think about it, you talk about it, and if you're in a group of people, if you, if this idea of this project, whatever it is, was born from a group of people, right? Right? You all go crazy. You're like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. I, I can't wait to do this. And then, and then you're going to do that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to do that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do the shit out of that. It's going to be amazing. And oh, my God. But you're going to do that, right? So that's still going to happen. Oh, yeah, don't worry about it, dude. It's totally going to happen. This is going to be amazing. And we're going to do this. And we're going to have that. And there's going to be things all over the place. It's going to be amazing. And then that phase passes. You You leave that phase. And... You get to a point where you're like, all right, let's be more real now. <laughs> let's be more real about what this is going to be, about whatever this project is going to be. I wanted to re refinish the deck, and I'm really excited. I want to build a deck, and I'm going to, oh, yeah, oh, my God, I'm going to, I'm going to go to, I, I'm going to draw up plans. Let's say you're a draftsman. I'm going to draft plans. I'm going to take them to my local municipality. I'm going to get permits to do it. Oh, my God, I've done so much. I'm so excited. I can't wait. And then you get to a point where it's like, holy shit, I got to buy the lumber. Holy shit, I got to cut the lumber. I've got to measure and cut. Measure twice, cut once. I've got to do all that. And I've got to make this pile of lumber and all, the, all these nails and bolts and paint and varnish and lacquer or whatever the hell it is you're doing. I don't even know if you put those on an outside deck. Probably not because it's outside. You've got, I've got to make all of these look like what I had in my head. I've got to make all of these look like the, the drawings that I had up 
all the sketches and all the things that I just created in my mind. And I've got to do it. Ah, shit. Well, that's a lot of goddamn work. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. This week's really busy. And something similar, of course, happened with PKA Plays. PKA Plays is a dynamite idea. It just is. We've got everything that we need in PKA Plays. Painkiller already, for those of you that don't know, a kind of a big podcast. If you're listening to this show, you've probably heard of it. And PKA Plays, dynamite idea. We've got everything we need to have a great... We've already got the camaraderie. We've already got the trash talk. We've already got the, the video game acumen. We have what many people strive months, possibly even years, looking for in a YouTube, quote, crew. It's already there. It's, it's been there for a long time. I forget when I joined the show. I think I want to say it was late 2012, early 2013. I, I, I want to believe. <laughs> Who the fuck knows? Well, no, we're episode 78. I joined around episode 100. So, yeah, it's been more than a cal- calendar year. So it'll be um, fall 2012, probably, is when I joined the show around that time. 2014 right now. Yeah. And we've got all that. And so we we worked ourselves up into a tizzy with the idea of PKA Plays and how much fun it could be and how much fun the content would be that we could create from such an idea. And we went through that initial phase and it was, okay, well, what games can we play? Right? Because we've, well, let's talk about all the great things we can do. Okay, we can do this great thing, that, and and okay, and now, oh my God, think of all the games we could play. Look at all these amazing games that are out there that we could all play in a, in a, in a multiplayer setting and have fun with and create cut fun content for everybody, and it's going to be amazing. It was going to be awesome. And then it got to the, well, all right, well, let's do it. Well, you know, Woody, <laughs> Woody has gone back to working 12-hour days on his Minecraft server. As, as head IT admin guy. And that's a big job. And that's his biggest job. And that, that obviously comes first. And it would be silly to be like, hey, there should be this other thing that comes first. No. Woodycraft comes first. His Minecraft server comes first. And that's totally reasonable. Same thing with Kyle. Kyle's got business interests he's got to take care of. And those come first. Me, I, I, I do stuff on YouTube. That's, that's my gig. So I'm always ready to go. I'm always here ready to, ready to do stuff, ready to play games, ready to do it. So other things just kind of got in the way. And then we had, to, we had to, to retreat back a bit from the initial elation at the idea of performing or executing this idea. We had to go back. Okay, all right, all right. So it was a great idea, great plan, could be huge, could be amazing for everybody involved. Everybody wins. We get to have fun. Viewers get entertaining content, and advertisers get a place where everybody's going to congregate, and they get to shill their product for a little bit, and we get to make a little money on the back end. It's a, it's a, it's a giant train that everybody kind of wins. All right. Now we have to implement it practically. And that's far different sometimes than what you see in your head or what you think in your head or what you come up with in a group. Your science projects in elementary school were always going to be the best goddamn science projects ever. They were going to be, you were going to create CERN. You were going to recreate CERN on that little desktop with that poster board, with that three panel poster board and your magic markers and your your printed out graphs and tables and charts and all those things. You were going to rival CERN. You were going to blow everybody's mind at that science fair project. But what did it up end up being? You made a volcano, didn't you? You lit up a light bulb with a potato. You did it. We all did it. I remember making the volcano with my dad. Or you made a potato gun. I actually, my dad helped me make a potato gun. And you did it. And that was your science project. Looking back on it, was it anything? No. But in your mind, when you were initially thinking of it, when you were initially tasked, you've got to create this science project, what are you going to do? You were, you were going to figure out and solve the mysteries of the universe. You were going to make everybody, everybody who viewed your science project have that aha moment. That moment where everything just 
where it clicks and everything falls into place after that. You were going to inspire that in everybody that looked at your poster board. Did you? No. Did you have fun doing it? Well, yeah. But there was a time when you had to progress from recreating the Large Hadron Collider to, oh, I'm just making a, I'm just making a chemical volcano. That's all I'm doing. And it's cool. The chemical, chemical volcano, cool. And it demonstrates, it taught you, number one, how to, you know, deadlines on a project. There, there were, there were the, the obvious goals, which was to create a, a science project and demonstrate an understanding of these fundamental scientific principles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, 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 we know. Then there was the, the underlying things that the, the more, um, uh, the more subversive. I want to say, so. no, I, I've used subversive. I'm using that wrong. I swear I'm using it wrong. I'm going to get it right one of these days. But then come the more, I don't want to say underhanded, but the underlying lessons being, do you work well in a group? How do you use, can you use Microsoft Excel or whatever, pro, whatever, um, whatever program at the time, or, or can you, can you, do you know how to, how to draw an X, Y graph or create a chart on a piece of paper with a ruler and a pencil? And then can you be a little bit artistic, but then still communicate what you want to, can you make your message appealing, but still communicate your message? And, and most importantly, can you work well on a project that has a deadline? That's, those are, those are just one of the many of things that were involved in getting you to create your chemical little volcano that you had there, which was amazing and the best one ever. And so at some point, you had to realize, or somebody had to realize for you, probably your parents or teacher, had to realize you're not, re you're not, you're not, you're not discovering the Higgs boson with this. It's just not happening. You're, you're learning all these things, and it's great, and it's going to be great, in, in your own little relativistic world, but you're not setting the world on fire. And all the ideas in your head have to be rolled back just a little bit. Not that they're wrong, not that they're bad, not that it's bad that you're excited, but you do have to be a little bit more realistic in, in what you want to create and your expectations for what you create. And that's what happens with PKA plays, just a little bit. And so some people might say we dogged on the idea and we kind of abandoned it for a while. And no, that wasn't the case. It was just there was there was initial moment of of excitement, genuine excitement about the idea. And then what has preceded this PKA or preempted this PKA is just a adults realizing the practical or, or trying to implement their ideas practically. And that happens with everything. And it will happen with everything you do from now on. And hopefully now you'll be able to notice it, perhaps even notice it earlier on. And in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, prevent some, prevent some, some unrealistic expectations, some unrealistic things. I've had videos that I thought was I was going to hit a home fucking run. I said... I looked at it in Sony Vegas and, and most recently Adobe Premiere, and I said, yes, this is the one. This is the one that's going to put me on the map. This is the one that's going to, to, to make me a part of something bigger. This is going to lead to bigger and better things. And I can see it now. I can see now how this thing that I have to say or this thing that I did is going to lead on and on down the path to this. And I can see it in my head, and, it, and I've thought through it many of times, and it makes perfect logical sense. And there's no choice but for this video or for this content to, to ascend me a level higher. And then it didn't. And then I had to realize, oh, I wasn't really doing anything special. I didn't really have anything that special to say. This is going to be the podcast that gets me a part of Adam Car or Carolla Digital. This is going to be the podcast that thousands of people subscribe to monthly and millions of people download monthly. This is going to be the one. This is going to be it. No, probably not. And that's okay. It's okay for probably not. Probably not is okay because probably not in this sense is usually offered up as a counter to something that's way more likely than not 
unrealistic. The lefty show going huge. I would love for the lefty show to go huge. I love doing this show. I mean, shit, I did multiple hours, a multi-hour show, a multi-hour podcast just now. A once a week, gotta hit a home run podcast, and here I am doing the lefty show. Because I love it. I do. I mean, I'm talking to OBS like I'm talking to you. <laughs> it's actually fucking pathetic. But it's it's okay. I, w- I mean, I would love for the lefty show. I digress. I would love for the lefty show to be huge. Love for the lefty show to put me on the map. To, to, to get my foot in the door with something. Whether it be Corolla Digital, like I mentioned, or Sirius, whatever. Somebody pays me money, good, m- good money for, for, for this business, for this actual business, not this business of people uploading videos to YouTube. But in, in, in the business of podcasting and, and making broadcast content, somebody pays big money for it. But it would be great. It's not realistic. It's just not. Because what do I have? I've got shitty graphics on the screen. And I thank you to the people that were very nice and saying, oh, those are pretty decent. No, they're shit. It's okay. It's okay that it's shit. It's okay. It's the best that I can do right now. And I'm learning. There's textures that I can see. I, I learned how to put textures on the background without having a texture pack. I learned how to put a little bit of texture uh, or, or create a brushed aluminum effect on the text itself on the lefty part. I learned how to do all that. I didn't teach myself. I, I went through some tutorials and I said, oh, okay. Now that, I, that I'm realizing more and more how Photoshop works, this makes more sense. All right. And I'm learning. I'm progressing. My sound quality. I can hear myself echo in my headphones. I can hear my echo, the, the slight echo be, of my voice echoing off hard surfaces and I hear it, and, I, and it, pisses, it pisses me off at times because I shouldn't have it. I should just bear down and, f- fuck it, I should borrow the money to build a kick-ass studio that's soundproof, no echoing, and I got a badass microphone, and every single portion of my voice is captured and, and digitized and saved and uploaded and downloaded by each and every one of you, or streamed. But streaming is actually kind of downloading, so, you know, same thing. But that's not going to happen right now. And despite my best dreams for this, despite my best dreams for that's not why you called, sometimes expectations are unrealistic. And, and it's okay. And it's okay to, to have to take a deep breath and go, okay, let's talk real now. So we talked real with PKA or PKA plays. And but... Again, what, what happened on PKA, to go back to what the, what the show originally started on, PKA plays is going to be a thing. I won't spoil it for you. you got to watch PKA to find out what we talk about and what we decide and what we're going to do. But it is there for you among many other enjoyable things, many other enjoyable topics. There's yucks to be had, great stories told, all there for you. PKA will be found on Woody's channel sometime Woody's Gamer Tag, youtube.com slash Woody's Gamer Tag sometime Saturday, May the 3rd. Or hey, who knows? Maybe he's feeling extra spiffy and he's gonna he's gonna upload that some bitch to run he's gonna run up against the lefty show. He's not he doesn't know what he's up against, Woody. I tell you what, right now, you better not you better not be uploading PKA right now to run up against the lefty show. Well that's all I gotta say. That's all I gotta say about that topic right there. You better not be doing it. Don't let me catch you doing it. This is my town. This is my time slot. <laughs> so, yeah, lots of good stuff on PKA. Hope you guys enjoy. I really do enjoy. Oh, and I wanted to cover this. Uh, a lot of people ask me why I don't upload Painkiller Already to my channel. I do, I do a backup recording just in case one of our, or Woody's recording fails. And just in case, you know, there's there's mine. And, and there was only one time where both failed. And they really did fail. It wasn't like a, a bullshit excuse to cover up some other fuck up. They both really did fail. And there wasn't anything to be done about it. Sadly. It's a really good show. But some people ask, why do I not upload PKA to my channel? And I, I hesitate to bring it up on Painkiller Already itself because I don't want to... I want to be really cautious about making it seem as though I'm trying to grab the spotlight 
that is collectively shown on P- PKA and try to shine it on myself and talk about me. I, 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 some people think that I don't want to talk about me. I just don't want to seem like I want to talk about me. I don't want to... Dealing from per- personal experience and, and telling stories is one thing. However, when the only thing out of my mouth is I, 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 me, 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 that's to me, I wouldn't like that. I don't think I would like that in terms of a a show that is a, a an ensemble cast of people and the whole is supposed to be greater than the sum of their individual parts. That's the whole idea. And so on an ensemble show, if I were to go my, my, me, me, mine, it would it would kind of detract. So anyway, that's that's that talking about me personally. But that's why I don't talk about it on PKA proper. However, the reason I don't is I don't want to fracture the viewership. Viewership on YouTube is a big thing. I, I remember Call of Duty popular first person shooter video game. Perhaps you've heard of it. There was a I believe it was 402 who was the community manager for Infinity Ward for a while was asked about or no, it was uh, it was actually David Vonderhaar. It wasn't 402. It was David Vonderhaar who was the lead developer. He's not a he's not a creative man or, or a, a uh, a, a content manager or he's not a he's not a liaison between the public and and the development crew David Vonderhaar is an actual develop, lead developer he's the guy with the with the he's the man with the plan at Treyarch Studios and he was talking about why people why he didn't have some playlist or other whatever it uh, it was running all the time in a Call of Duty game and his answer I remember it vividly even though I forgot it was him at first. But I remember the answer vividly is he was talking about fracturing the player base. When you start adding game mode after game mode after game mode, you create as many opportunities for people to go one place and not another. You create opportunities for people to go play 1v1 cage match instead of populating team deathmatch, instead of populating domination instead of populating headquarters or search and destroy. And that starts to mess with matchmaking and, and then all these all these narrow technical things that have to do with the game itself. But the idea of being mindful of fracturing fracturing a base of people, a base of consumers, stuck with me. And so when I was uh, when I was graciously asked and and eternally grateful I am to join the PKA cast, even though I had a recording of my own in my back pocket and I could start uploading it as, as soon as the show ended or, or when Woody's went live, I could upload mine just to be, you know, he's lead dog. Even though I could, I think it, it has the potential to draw eyes away from what is the, what is the, the moneymaker, which is the advertisements. And it has, it has the opportunity to kind of fracture a viewer base and have not many people, not have as many accountable eyes, and the key word there is accountable, accountable eyes on the product itself, which is what we use in effect to sell ad time on PK. That's how, you know, eyes on this show, eyes on the lefty show will determine how the lefty show is sold if it is to be sold to prospective advertisers. That's just the way it that's just the way it is. And so, you know, I, I know sub overlap and not all of my subscribers overlap with Woody's, but a lot of them do. And were I to upload it on my own, that would fracture not only would it fracture the viewer base, it would kind of fracture the branding. Our recordings are kind of the same, but not really. Sometimes we might not have the same overlay, et cetera, et cetera. It creates an aura about the show or it has the potential to create an aura about the show that isn't intended and could actually be harmful. And and while I would welcome the opportunity to upload the show, and, it, and if Woody, who obviously knows more about being good at YouTube than I, has says, well, no, it, it, that can only help. If somebody in the know that knows more than me or than I says, no, 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 you're wrong, that can only help, then okay, then we'll revisit it. But as for right now, I default to trying to protect the product that is PKA. And if I have the slightest inkling that uploading it to to my channel would 
hurt the the product, well then I'm just not going to do it. It's it, it's easy for me to it's easier for me to not upload the show than it is for me to have start you know been uploading the show and then not do it. So I just don't do it. And also, it's not really mine. It I, I I've said this time and time again, but in terms of being a being a member of something, it's hard to feel at home. At least for me, it's hard to feel at home in a place unless I've been there from the ground up. It's hard to feel just, uh, you know, when you get home, wherever you live, whatever is home for you, whatever you identify as home, that feeling you get when you're there, that, for lack of a better term, familiarity you have with where you live, it's not the same when you go to a hotel, is it? It's just not. It's not the same when you move. When, when you move, initially, you don't feel like you're living at home. You feel like your home was where you left, but you moved, so you can't go back. Eventually, you start to learn. But for me, feeling at home on the cast of PKA is essentially saying PKA is equal parts mine. And I just don't feel that it really is. And I guess I'm taking cues from a, a tremendous, what I think is a tremendous movie, Rockstar, starring Mark, Mark Wahlberg. In that PKA is is like the fictional steel dragon in the movie. That's what PKA is. PKA existed before me. PKA will exist after me. Well, maybe not, but let's just let's not go down that road just yet. PKA existed before me and was a thing before me. It still is a thing with me, perhaps a bit more of a thing than it was. However, I am not the reason it is a thing. And I was not a contributor to the reason it was initially a thing. And so while PKA is Steel Dragon, I'm Mark Wahlberg's character. I'm Chris Izzy Cole. I'm the scab they brought in when the lead singer left the band. When the lead singer was was clashing too much with the other guys. You, uh, spoiler alert, by the way, earmuffs. Spoiler alert! When it turns out the lead singer is gay and the rest of the band doesn't respect him anymore, then it's time to get somebody else. It's time to it's time to to add by or uh, addition by subtraction and then addition again because you're adding. And so they go out and they they do a, a, a slow a uh, a quiet search and they find Mark Wahlberg's character Chris later be called becomes called Izzy Cole. And that's probably the best uh, metaphor or simile that I can think of for my position with PKA and just how I approach it. And just in general, I tend to try to, I default to trying to show too much respect. I figure it's more harmful to not show enough respect than it is to show too much respect. Being irreverent about something in my mind, is always worse than being patronizing or even seeming like you're being patronizing. So that's my approach to Painkiller already. I hope you guys have enjoyed the uh, my appearance and and my uh, my performances on the show, and I hope you enjoy this one. should be pretty good. So let's jump into some news for the day. Friday, an interesting story. I didn't get to cover it earlier in the week. I meant to cover it, and it just kind of slipped my mind. It just did. But Jameis Winston, the quarterback for the Florida State Seminoles, football team, college team in America, was allegedly caught shoplifting food. Shoplifting food. Now, Jameis Winston was in the news, well, last year or or earlier this year because of alleged rape charges. Well, the there were rape charges, but (laughs) the the rape was alleged. And after a while, after the supposed incident occurred in uh, Tallahassee police, it's in Tallahassee, Florida, is the campus of Florida State. After Tallahassee police kind of dragged their feet, finally they talked to the alleged victim and the victim reported it. And they there was a whole to do about whether charges were going to be filed against Jameis Winston for rape. It turns out they weren't. There wasn't enough evidence for the the prosecutor said, just look, there's not enough evidence. And everybody went nuts because, you know, 
I guess apparently in our society, the minute somebody is accused of rape, they're automatically guilty and it's up to the, the court system to hash it out. Because, no, it doesn't... It, it, it's completely out of mind, the idea of what happens to the person, what is that life like for the man or woman whom is falsely co- accused of rape and has a false arrest charge, okay? That's the key. That's the key here. A lot of people wonder why I'm big on arrest, why I'm big on, on DUI arrests as bullshit or, or, or drug enforcement arrests as bullshit. And in this case, why going on just... He raped me. And then, bam, arrest. Get him in the cuffs. Get him in there and investigate, investigate. And we'll just get him in the cuffs, get him in jail. And then we'll let the we'll let the judge and the courts decide. A lot of people wonder why I'm against that. And here's why. Because that arrest never goes away. Ever. Never, ever, ever the arrest goes away. You can, you can suppress the proceedings. You can suppress... I was convicted of this, I pled to this, or whatever. You can try to have all those records expunged. You can. Of course, you got to petition the court, which is another reason why, well, you can have it expunged. Really? Okay, how do you do that? Well, you got to go back to court. Are you going to do it? No, you got to hire a lawyer. However, just, you can suppress the proceedings, all that stuff. You can make sure, it, hopefully, it never sees the light of day. However, that arrest record, no matter what you expunge, it will never, never go away that this person on such and such a date was arrested for rape by such and such an officer. Here's blah, 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 blah. That line item will never, ever go away. And that's why, despite what cop shows would have you believe, Arrest, and and in, a, in our society, in our ultra-aware, everybody's information is everywhere society, that's kind of a big deal. The, the idea that even falsely accused, even if you are acquitted of the charges, the arrest itself is sometimes almost as bad. And so that is why I'm kind of big on we shouldn't just go around charging people with crimes and hoping that the justice system figures it out. Because sometimes the very fact that you were charged with a crime is a pretty big damn deal. And the next time, let's say Jameis Winston was charged with rape, ultimately acquitted, ultimately acquitted of the rape. Now, we don't even have to go on down the line where he's submitting a resume, okay? We don't even have to do that. It's really easy because he's in the public eye. Jameis Winston is good enough to go into the NFL, He's going to play in the NFL, tremendous athlete, tremendous quarterback, going to get drafted. But what does that do? What does the mere, okay, let's assume it's all in the up up and up. It was a totally false rape charge. Even though the facts of the case, Winston was doing something wrong that night. It just was. But let's assume facts of the, it was, it was all in the up and up and it just turned out that it was a false rape charge. Some, uh, I don't want to say his girlfriend decided that she didn't like him anymore and didn't want to have sex with him or or had thought that sex with him was a bad idea after the fact and then cried rape and now he got arrested. Well, he gets acquitted, right, of hopefully he gets acquitted and it all goes away. But that arrest is still there. That arrest was still in the public eye. What does that do to Jameis Winston's draft stock? What does that do to his employment prospects? The mere fact that he was arrested. Oh, sure, he was acquitted. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, he's acquitted, yeah. But the NFL is still aware that he was arrested on rape charges, on charges of rape. Now, keep in mind, in the meta sense, in this sense, we know we know exactly what happened. He didn't rape. It was not rape. It was consensual sex. We know it wasn't rape. However... The NFL doesn't. In the NFL, the only thing the NFL can go off of is this line item that says, well, you were arrested for charges of rape. <laughs> Have fun trying to get your way out of the fifth round of the draft and staying on an NFL roster, even though you were pegged as a, as a top five pick before this whole thing. And, and, then, and that's Jameis Winston, who's going to be a millionaire. How does it work for Joe Schmo? Joe Schmo who's barely holding on to a job. The middle class is, where the fuck is it going? It's like dark energy. Where's it going? Oh my God, where's it going? And he's trying to hold on to everything. Just He's trying to hold his life together just long enough. 
And then there's a bullshit arrest charge. I know I'm not going to harp on rape because again, rape is a is a touchy sh- subject. And the minute you utter it, people just they they divide along the line and they go to their they they polarize and then they're not fucking moving because there's there's no chance of having an honest discussion about this kind of thing. But it's, so this Joe Schmo middle class guy gets a bullshit arrest on his record. Bullshit. We again in the meta sense we know it's bullshit, but the arrest is there. So now the guy goes try to get a new job. It's an employer's market. Middle class is going nowhere. You got people with people that have college degrees, people that have postgraduate degrees are happy, happy to get a job that's just paying a, 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 a pubic hair, a human hair above minimum wage. Happy to do it. That's the system. Where, and so that guy goes to get a job. And he's up against however many other people, so many other applicants for this job. And he's interviewing. And they, they pull his they pull his. His file, his arrest record, they run a background track, as any prudent employer should. And then they say, oh, man, this guy here. See, uh, two years ago, he was arrested. For what? Oh, for the, for this crime. Whatever it is, right? Well, what happened? Well, does it fucking matter? He was arrested. Does it, does it matter? Who cares what the result was? He was arrested on pot charges. He was arrested on, on, on suspicion of... He had he had he had too much cash on him at the time. He was arrested and his his property seized on suspicion of on suspicion of of, of drugs and, and running drugs. Can't have a guy like that working for this company. Are you out of your mind? My ass is on the line. And that's how it would go. And that's why I am of the mind that we should be, even though the idea of the justice system and we, we have to put our, our faith into it or I hate using faith. We have to trust in the justice system at some point. I also don't think it's a good idea to go around arresting people and having that follow them around for the rest of their lives because the system does get it wrong. People are arrested for bullshit reasons and they go to jail and spend nights, weekends, weeks in jail because they can't afford bail. And it's bullshit. And that never, ever goes away. And it puts them at a disadvantage. And it is, the system is supposed to be blind. But one aspect of the system isn't blind at all. It's just, it has the potential to be nothing but pure and utter bullshit that hampers people for life. And I I, I think that's, that's just totally wrong. However, getting back to, I totally digress, but this is the lefty show. Damn it, that's what we do. Jameis Winston allegedly caught shoplifting crab legs. Now, d- there wasn't much from that. There wasn't a there wasn't a, a statement from the team. There wasn't a, a a statement from Jameis Winston. However, there was a statement from his friend who plays on Florida State's basketball team, and he went on a little mini Twitter rant talking about how his friend Jameis Winston was stealing crab legs because the NCAA during finals during finals only allows during because of their amateur rules the NCAA has to they they impose amateurism on teenagers who make them billions of dollars the imposed amateurism rules dictate that Jameis Winston is only entitled to one meal a day one meal a day during finals week. And Jameis Winston now, of course, probably taking bullshit classes anyway. However, that's irrelevant. The fact that the NCAA is this guy's employer, practically the, his employer, legally speaking, uh, states, state courts might have to start ruling on that pretty quickly, and that's going to get very interesting. But practically speaking, effectively, the NCAA, by way of this university, employs Jameis Winston. And part of their rules of employment are you cannot receive undue benefits because of this platform that we create or we help create for your athletic endeavors. You cannot profit from them. You cannot receive these kinds of benefits, such and such and such. And meals are on there. It gets to the point where the NCAA limits calories. 
the NCAA has caloric guidelines for what constitutes illegal benefits. If something you got, if you got something from somebody that if, if some booster or if some employee of the university or some outside person gave an NCAA student, quote, student athlete a, a, a plate of food and that plate of food rose above some caloric level, that NCAA athlete is in violation of NCAA bylaws liable to be suspended. That's where we are. And <laughs> it's it was in it was sad, not because Jameis Winston is possibly this train wreck, he's doing things that getting him accused of of rape and and now he's he's shoplifting things. No. It's a hungry a hungry kid, a hungry athlete, probably burning way more calories a day than you or I, just because his body's like, all right, well, we gotta, we gotta do all this shit. And he's so hungry that he's got to go steal food. And and stories, if you read and watch documentaries about how bullshit the NCAA is in terms of its forced amateurism on kids that make them billions of dollars. If you watch documentaries, there are stories of agents who say, yeah, I've had college athletes just show up at my door wanting food, not wanting money. Not wanting cars or clothes or women. No, they want food because they're so goddamn hungry. Because the NCAA is that pervasive in its, shit, I'll say it, its enslavement of these, the, the, its indentured servitude. There we go. It's forced indentured servitude of these teenagers who make them billions of dollars. The NCAA sold the rights of the March Madness tournament to CBS in, I want to say 2008, for $10 billion. Billions with a B. And I know what you're going to say. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Well, they're student athletes. They get scholarships. They get scholarships. So it evens out at the end. They get, they get a free education. First of all, try going to go to a major. I want you to enroll in a major university. I want you to go to a major university and take the classes that the athletes are taking because they have 40, 50, 60 hour a week commitments to their athletic commitments. Their, their commitments to the athletics department are 40, 50, 60 hours a week, even during the off season. Now go try to, now go try to be a full-time student and get yourself a real degree. Does it happen? Sure, of course it does. There was a player from, from Florida State who was a Rhodes Scholar. And for and 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 bypassed, foregoed or foregone, regardless, bypassed the NFL, passed up on an NFL contract to go do postgraduate work at I believe Oxford University. He's a Rhodes Scholar. Dude's a genius, probably. Sure, it happens. Of course, it does. However, the large bulk of kids who are getting quote paid in scholarships to play for the NCAA aren't taking real classes. They're just not. And they're not getting real degrees. They're just not. They're biding their time in the, until they can go into either coaching or go back to the university after their time playing football or basketball or in some schools, some, some smaller schools, baseball. They're biding their time until they can stop doing that or, or make it professionally. But a lot of them aren't. And so they're going to have either bullshit degrees or no degree and have to finish their bullshit degree, start over, or just try something else completely. Now, is that a reasonable compensation for athletic service that generates billions with a B in revenue? To me, I don't think so. And I think it's wrong. Now, the other side of it is the actual cost of attending a college. And there's a great, there's a great article on, on one of the sub, I, I like to call it a subreddit of Deadspin, one of the subsections of Deadspin called Regressing. It's a lot of nerd numbers talk, and, uh, and this piece was written by, uh, by an economist, I believe, called How Athletic Departments and the Media Fudge the Cost of Scholarships. And the general principle is this. When, 
when oil is being pumped in a pipeline, in the, at least in the United States, right? There's, there's, there's the oil well, and then it needs to be pumped usually to a refinery. You don't build a refinery right where the, where the rigs are. You build a pipeline, and you build a big-ass refinery, and you pump all the oil there. Well, for liability reasons, most likely, law requires that the pipeline company, whoever it is, take legal ownership of the oil while it is being transported in the pipeline. So if there's a different company that does the oil drilling, then at by some legal means, the pipe company, the oil pipe company, is going to have to take possession of that oil for, it, for the duration of its trip. Then it can be given to whomever owns the refinery, probably the people that do the drilling. And the workaround for this, the way they do it, traditionally is a contract that I learned is called a buy sell. And what it is, is that at the pump or, or at the drill, the oil pump company buys oil, buys, literally buys it. They say, okay, you're, it's in, we'll, we'll stick to drums for a bit. I will pay you a hundred dollars. I, the oil pipe company will pay you the driller and the refiner, the driller, a hundred dollars a barrel at the pump. I will pay you a hundred dollars. And at the point of the drilling, I will take it and I will put it into my pipeline. And what, what I do with it in my pipeline under your business, cause it's mine now and I will transport it. And when it, and when it, Oh, by golly, when it ends up at your refinery, you agree to buy it back from me at $150. That's what you got to do. I buy it from you at $100 at the, at the drill. I transport it. You agree to buy it back from me at $150, let's say, whatever it is, at the refinery. Now, what have, what have they really contracted to do? It's just the oil company, the, the driller, has contracted with the pipeline to say, look, I will pay you $50 a barrel effectively, net, I will pay you a net $50 a barrel to transport this oil through your pipeline. Then that's it. So now if we think, if we apply that, it's, the, the article does it infinitely better than I can. However, if we apply that to the idea of, of scholarships, well, the list price of a scholarship is whatever it is. It is whatever, whatever it is. $50,000 a year to go to, to, Fuck you, right? To go to that. And so $50,000 a year, no aid, no nothing. That's what it costs, right? Well, no, that's the price. That's what they're willing to charge. That's what, that's the MSRP. You don't pay MSRP on a car on the lot. Are you crazy? No, because that's unreasonable. MSRP is just, is, is the, the vanilla. It's in a vacuum. That's where MSRP and, and price exist. We got to whittle it down to what the cost is. What's the cost of a scholarship? Well, most universities try to say, well, we give $50 million or $20 million a year to the athletic department for scholarships. But what are they really doing? Because the athletic department and the university are the same thing. So when a university gives the athletic, gives the athletic department $20 million for scholarships, what they're really doing is giving, quote, giving the athletic department $20 million in, in effective credit to offer scholarships, but the athletic department pays that right back in the term, in, in just providing, in providing players that generate revenue and so on and so forth. The cost of a scholar, it means nothing. It's one, one hand shifting money to the other. So whatever, whatever colleges try to say, it costs $60,000 a year, $70,000 a year for these athletes to go to school here. Well, what's the real opportunity cost there? And what are you really doing? What are you really paying to house and feed and, and let, let athletes attach their name to bullshit class lists and attend bullshit classes and buildings that you've already, you've already paid for and already built? What's the real cost there? And what are you losing by having that, the athlete there instead of a quote, full paying customer? It's just, it's bullshit. It's, it doesn't really cost the university $60,000 a year. So Jamaeus Winston can play football for them. 
It just doesn't. So that that defense of, well, that's why the NCAA isn't really employing players and they shouldn't pay players who generate them billions with a B dollars in revenue is it's missing the point. And it's it's sometimes presented disingenuously by the NCAA, but sometimes people just don't stop to think about it. Sometimes people just don't stop to think about things like that. It's just, oh, shit. Because I know when I read this article, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> okay, that's a lot going in there. That's, that's a really nice argument that, that you got yourself going on there. So when we're talking about the real cost it's much different than the listed cost or listed price. Just like when you're buying a car. Buying a car, whatever it is, used, as is, whatever. New, certified, pre-owned, doesn't matter. Your, your goal, always, your goal is to always end up paying less than the list price. And as such, the list price, because the dealers know that, the list price is always more than they paid on the car. Always. Sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's a little. Walmart. Walmart does the same thing, just at a, at a much smaller level. And that's that rolls me right into something that I think is pretty cool. That It's cool and it's, it's, it's kind of sickening at the same time. It's how... Numbers and statistics, just like we talked about, or just like I just talked about, in the NCAA and, and defenders of the NCAA saying, well, it costs $60,000 a year or whatever. So it costs the MSRP, let's say, a year for, for athletes to go to school. So that's their payment. No, 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 it doesn't. But the idea of how statistics and the, the at least appearance of up and up mathematics can be used to sway people. Because if you imagine, imagine a bar graph. We all know a bar graph, right? But imagine it doesn't have on the x and y axis, it's just a line. There's no, there, there are no indicators, there's no range and on any, on x or y. So you don't know what you're looking at. But what you do know is that, let's say it's a bar graph of individual items and, and what Walmart, let's say, pays for those items and what they sell them for, okay? So there's going to be two lines on this graph, and it goes up and down, up and down for each individual item because it doesn't really matter. But if you zoomed way in, way in to that, to that graph, you would still be showing the same thing. You would still be showing the difference in price in – in buying the product, in Walmart buying the product, and Walmart selling the product, product, you'd still be showing those same things. And even if you did properly mark out the graph and then properly, uh, properly drew each graph, you probably marked out the the coordinates and then connected the dots, right? And so, it, and but then you just you just erase the rulers on on each side on the x and y axis. You're still showing the same thing. So you zoom way in. And you say, this is the difference. And, and I could say, this is the difference between what Walmart pays for products and what they sell them for. Look at that huge, oh my God, do you see it? Do you see? Do you see the light? Yes, yes, Jesus H. Tap Dance in Christ, I have seen the light. Great, great scene from the Blues Brothers. You should totally watch it. And I can show you and say, yes, look, do you see? Oh, my God, look at this disparity. Look at how much money. They're mongers. Walmart is evil. Walmart is just, in, they are, they are just not in my town. Get them out of here. No more Walmart. Bad. Similarly, Walmart could zoom way the fuck out. Way the fuck out. And say, do you see, do you see that? Eh, you see just about the width. Like you can barely tell they're different lines. The lines have to be drawn on this graph in different colors so as to allow you to differentiate between one line and the other. You have to be able to see that they are different lines. You have to know that they're different lines. Otherwise, you would think they're the same. That is our profit margin. That's what we make. We're not evil. We're, sh we're selling you bottom dollar. We're barely covering everything we've, we've got to expend. Barely. Oh, my God. 
I mean, we could raise prices, but that would be bad. And we've got to, we've got to, we care about the common man. And that's what, we, that's why we exist. And that was one of our founding principles and whatever his name is, Wall, whatever the hell. Jay Wall or, no, that's John Wall. <laughs> John Wall did not found Walmart. Maybe he did. He did the Dougie when he walked in. But at the end of the day, both editorial descriptions of what we're seeing aside we're both talking about the diff- the same thing the same at its core mathematically honest but how we draw that mathematically honest graph how we display those mathemat- those those originally mathematically honest statistics drastically changes the stories that we can spin and the things that we can say and while science and and l- watching the cosmos Great story about about the scientists who originally accurately dated the Earth using lead concentration. He built the first clean rooms and was and was did did the the, the spectrometry or spec spectrometry no spectrum matani whatever <laughs> um and and did all the work to he like said looked at lead levels and as lead decays it, it go, things decay into lead and all that stuff he said oh well the earth is 4.6 billion years old and then he found then he started finding out through, finding out through all his research lead is really bad lead is very 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 bad very bad and holy shit why is there so much lead why is there so much lead in the upper levels of the ocean? Deep, deep ocean, ocean water does not have anywhere near this kind of lead concentration. And we should know, based on how oceans mix, we know about how long it would take if this was a natural process. We know how long it should take for this lead concentration to get down to the deep ocean. And it should be there. It's not. Why isn't it there? Holy shit, it's leaded gasoline. Oh my God, that's terrible. We're all breathing it in. It's in our water. It's in our drinking water. It's everywhere because of leaded gasoline. And then all of a sudden, the gasoline companies had their own scientist. Their own scientist who said, there's no evidence that that leaded gasoline contributes to any kind of any kind of public health concern. No reason, no documented evidence of this, that, and the other. And it just, it's... In some ways, it can be frightening that you learn to trust the institutions of math and science as credible sources of of real information, real information. But even in those hallowed institutions, sometimes they can be perverted for other causes. They can be perverted so that tobacco executives can sit in front of the U.S. Congress and say, there's no credible scientific evidence that smoke causes cancer or anything like that. And it's a minefield, and you've got to be careful. Everybody's got to be careful. Look at everything you read. Somebody's, some charlatans trying to sell you something, trying to sell you some product, maybe supposed to increase your brain activity or something like that, and they show you all these graphs. Look at these graphs. Look at them. Look at them all. And then you say, well, wait a minute. What are we really looking at here? Yeah, I'm looking at a difference, but what's the scale of this difference? Walmart's profit margin is really, I read from from another source, I could be talking completely out my ass, Walmart's profit margin is really only 3% or thereabouts. But if I zoom way in to the graph, it looks huge. If I make the, if I make the bounds of the the upper and upper and lower bounds of the graph itself small enough, I can make the disparity look huge. And if I make the upper and lower bounds of the y-axis or x-axis, however the fuck you want to draw it, if I make it large enough, the disparity looks really, 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 really small. Like they're practically giving them away at cost. But they're not. It's more like 3%. Every, even science and math have the ability to be perverted. And so you got to be careful. You got to be careful and you got to make sure you're getting, you're actually seeing what you're seeing. Because the NCAA would have you believe that these fine institutions of learning, of higher learning, are actually paying, actually losing 
$40,000 per scholarship athlete. That that scholarship athlete is actually getting $40,000 in value from their free scholarship. But are they really? You've got to look at some other things to find out. Anyway, guys, that's my time. I'm going to wrap up the Lefty Show there. It's been, a, I think, a decent episode. Very, I had a lot of fun recording this. I hope you guys have has had as much fun listening. I hope you stick around. Likes and favorites uh, appreciated on YouTube as always. More to come next week. Not sure about this weekend in terms of recording podcasts. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll maybe I'll give my I'll give the old voice a a, a little bit of time off to um, to to recuperate, and we'll come back strong next week. Anyway, keep it here. YouTube.com slash LeftyOX. Anyway, guys, that's my time. I got to get out of here. Thank you for joining. I hope you enjoyed. I'm out. Peace.